Hello and welcome to our service of worship here in Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. Before we begin, let me give you two announcements. Because of government restrictions due to COVID-19, the church building will be closed until Friday the 11th of December. So instead of meeting in the church on Wednesday evening for the prayer meeting, we'll meet by Zoom at seven o'clock on Wednesday. Please let me know if you don't know the contact details or the login details. And the second announcement is simply that if all goes well, we'll meet in the church for worship next Sunday morning, the 13th of December. Our call to worship today is based on Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 50. Our souls magnify the Lord, our spirits rejoice in God our Saviour. The Mighty One has done great things for us. Holy is God's name. Let us worship God. For God is our maker and our redeemer. We'll worship God by singing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. turn to God in prayer. Almighty God our Father, you are the great God who lives in a high and holy place. You are from everlasting to everlasting. 
You do not change, but you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you're perfectly wise and powerful and holy and just and good and true. And we therefore worship and adore you. And we rejoice because just as you promised, you sent your only son into the world to ransom your people from condemnation, to free us from Satan's tyranny and from the power of death and from the depths of hell, to fill us with joy and peace and to open wide the gates of heaven and to lead us to our heavenly home. We know that we don't deserve any of this because we're sinners who sin against you continually. But we rejoice in your grace and mercy and kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we confess our sins and shortcomings before you. Instead of walking in your ways, we have all like sheep gone astray and turned to our own way. You made us to glorify you and to enjoy you forever. But we have dishonored you by the things we have said and done. Though you have called us to be holy, we confess that often we are just like those who do not believe. Instead of displaying the fruit of your spirit in our lives, very often the only thing people see in us are the works of the flesh. You've commanded us to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. You've commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves. But we have fallen short of doing your will. And far too often we have put ourselves first of all. Heavenly Father, we confess our sins and shortcomings. And we ask that you will forgive us for the sake of Christ our Savior, who shed his blood on the cross to free us from the penalty of our sins. And so for his sake, please forgive us. And will you fill us with your spirit to renew us and help us to display on our lives love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. May these qualities be in us more and more. And help us to worship you today. Minister to us through the reading and preaching of your word. Convince and convert those who don't yet believe. Build up believers in holiness and comfort. And fill us all with zeal for the glory of your name. And we ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Having confessed our sins, hear the good news from 1 John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God for his kindness to us. Once again, I've got some pictures for the boys and girls and uh, this is the first one. This is the first picture. I wonder uh, if you look at it, can you work out what the, uh, the story is or where in the Bible uh, this, uh, this story is from? Uh, you've got, let me see, you've got some uh, soldiers in the background and uh, then you've got a man there. He's one of the disciples in blue and he's uh, got a, a sword in his hand or a knife and he's cutting off the ear of this other poor man uh, in the front I wonder if you can work out what the story is. I'm sure you can. Uh, we're thinking just at the moment of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you remember he was there with his disciples and he was praying late at night. And then Judas Iscariot came and he was leading a crowd of people with him. Uh, soldiers and guards who had come to arrest the Lord Jesus and to take him away. And you might remember the story, whenever uh, Peter saw the guards, he took out his sword to defend the Lord Jesus and to attack the people who had come to arrest him. And we read how he took a sword and he sliced off the ear of this uh, poor man. But you remember, 
Jesus immediately told them to stop. He said, stop and put your sword away. Uh, that's not what he wanted from his disciples. Uh, when the, even though these soldiers had come to arrest him, the Lord Jesus wasn't going to fight back, but he was prepared to go with them. So that's the first story or the first picture. Here's the second one now. Uh, it's a wee bit later in the story and uh, Jesus has been taken to the Sanhedrin. That was to one of the courts and it was made up of the priests and the Sadducees and all these other important people. And they wanted to accuse Jesus of various crimes. And uh, this man in red, he's one of the witnesses who came forward. All these different witnesses came forward and they accused Jesus of having done all these wrong things. But of course, we know, and the Bible tells us, that all of the witnesses were false witnesses. They weren't telling the truth. They were making up stories about the Lord Jesus. And one of the remarkable things is that even though these people were accusing Jesus and making up stories about him, he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, fight back. He didn't argue with them. He didn't... Uh, defend himself but he just sat quietly and listened to everything that was going on they were making up stories about him but he didn't complain he didn't criticize them he didn't attack them he just sat silently and now the third picture this is the last picture today now we're thinking about jesus on the cross so jesus was uh, taken by the sanhedrin to pilate the roman governor and the Roman governor uh, gave in to the pressure upon him by the crowds, and he decided that Jesus must die. So they, again, the soldiers took him, they whipped him, they beat him, and they nailed him to the cross. And of course, you might remember that uh, even though the Roman soldiers were treating Jesus so very cruelly, he didn't uh, attack them, and he didn't insult them, but indeed he prayed for them. But in the picture here, this is a picture of some of the people who were standing around near the cross. And so Jesus was on the cross. He was suffering and dying. And these people down below were shouting up at Jesus and they were mocking him. They were laughing at him. They were insulting the Lord Jesus. You saved others, but you can't save yourselves. Come down from the cross and then we'll believe in you. They were insulting the Lord Jesus because they didn't believe in him. But once again, one of the remarkable things is that even though these men were insulting Jesus, he didn't insult them back. He didn't uh, attack them. He didn't criticize them. He didn't mock them. He uh, said nothing at all. Well, boys and girls and uh, everybody else who's listening, very often people will hurt us and our immediate reaction is to hurt them back. People insult us and we insult them back. People push us, and we go to push them back. But here we discover that the Lord Jesus was very different, and when people insulted him, he didn't insult them back. Uh, this is what Peter the Apostle writes in his letter. He says that when they hurled their insults at him, that's at Jesus, he did not retaliate. He didn't fight back. When he suffered, he made no threats. Peter is talking about the Lord Jesus and how he suffered so very much, and yet he didn't retaliate. He didn't push people back. He didn't insult people back. He didn't criticize people. He was very patient, and he endured it all. And Peter says to us that we're to do the same. We're to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't insult people back because he was prepared to suffer and to die on the cross to pay for our sins. And he calls on us now to do the same. So if ever anyone pushes you, the Lord Jesus says to you, don't push them back. If anyone ever insults you, he says to you, don't insult them back. If anybody ever uh, hurts you, he says you're not to hurt them back. Let's ask the Lord to help us to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. And whenever he suffered threats, he did not retaliate and fight back. Whenever he suffered, uh, he did not fight back at all or make any threats. 
He did not insult anyone, but he endured all of this. He suffered all of this to save us from our sins and to give us eternal life. So help us to trust in him for forgiveness. And will you fill us all with your spirit to help us to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ so that when people push us, we won't push them back. Whenever people insult us, we won't insult them back. Whenever people hurt us, we won't hurt them back. Will you help us to do that and to be just like our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. We're going to read now from the Bible, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25. And in this chapter, we read how David was tempted to hurt somebody who had harmed him, but then he was stopped. So it's 1 Samuel chapter 25. We're going to read the whole of the chapter. And this is God's word. Now, Samuel died and all Israel assembled and mourned for him and they buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David moved down into the desert of Maon. A certain man in Maon who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. While David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them, and the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants, and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable towards my young men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. David said to his men, put on your swords. So they put on their swords and David put on his. About 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. One of the servants told Nabal's wife, Abigail, David sent messengers from the desert to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. And the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us all the time. We were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Abigail lost no time. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five seers of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisins, and two hundred cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. As she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there was David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. David had just said, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the desert so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one meal of all who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, My Lord, let the blame be on me alone. 
Please let your servant speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. May my Lord pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name is full and folly goes with him. But as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my master sent. Now, since the Lord has kept you, my master, from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, may your enemies and all who intend to harm my master be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my master be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's offense, for the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my master, because he fights the Lord's battles. Let no wrongdoing be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my master will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. When the Lord has done for my master every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him leader over Israel, my master will not have on his conscience this staggering burden of needless bloodshed and of having avenged himself. But when the Lord has brought my master success, remember your servant. David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house, holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him nothing until daybreak. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things and his heart failed him and he became like a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord, who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong, and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down in his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. His servants went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent us to you to take you to become his wife. She bowed down with her face to the ground and said, Here is your maidservant ready to serve you and wash the feet of my master's servants. Abigail quickly got on a donkey and, attended by her five maids, went with David's messengers and became became his wife. David also married a Hinnom of Jezreel, and they both were his wives. But Saul had given his daughter Michael, David's wife, to Paltiel, son of Lamech, Uh, Laish, who was from Galim. And we'll end the reading there at the end of the chapter, and we thank God for his word to us today. Let's turn to God in prayer for a moment. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 1 Samuel 25 is the meat in a sandwich. Uh, The meat in a sandwich or the cheese in a sandwich is surrounded by two slices of bread. And chapter 25 is the meat in a sandwich or it's like the cheese in the sandwich because it's surrounded by chapter 24 and chapter 26. You might remember from last week what chapter 24 was about. Saul had gone into a cave for a bathroom break, uh, not knowing that David and his men were hiding in the same cave. And it seemed to David's men that this was David's chance to kill Saul. But David refused. He would not harm Saul, who was still the Lord's anointed king. That's what happened in chapter 24. We haven't come to chapter 26 yet, but you may be familiar with it. 
David and one of his men crept into Saul's camp at night when Saul was sleeping. And as far as David's companion was concerned, this was their chance once again to kill Saul. Let me pin Saul to the ground with my spear, he said. But once again, David refused. He was not going to harm the Lord's anointed king. So in chapter 24, David had the chance to kill Saul, but he refused to do so. And in chapter 26, David had the chance to kill Saul, but he refused to do so. And in the middle of those two chapters, we have chapter 25. And in this chapter, David wants to kill someone. He's all set to kill someone. He and his men have strapped on their swords and they're on the warpath. They're ready to kill this man, Nabal. But Abigail, who was Nabal's wife, managed to persuade David not to do so. Uh, she reminded him that he would one day be king. And what he was planning to do to Nabal was not the kind of thing the Lord's anointed king should do. When the Lord's anointed king is insulted, he should not retaliate. When the Lord's anointed king suffers, he must make no threats. Instead of taking matters into his own hands, the Lord's anointed king is to entrust himself to him who judges justly. In other words, he must trust, entrust himself to God. And you see, that's what God's true anointed king, Jesus Christ, would be like. And so once again, what we read here about David speaks to us of Christ the Savior, who did not retaliate or make threats, but who was prepared to suffer and to die for sinners. In the very first sentence of this chapter, we're told about the death of Samuel. Now, we haven't heard much about Samuel recently. Although back in chapter 19, after David first fled from Saul, he went to Samuel and told him everything that Saul had done. And since Samuel was a prophet, then presumably David went to him for a word from the Lord and for some advice. But now Samuel has died. And so who is going to advise David now? Who is going to reveal to him the will of the Lord? Who is going to keep him on the right path? Well, as we'll see from this chapter, even though Samuel was dead, the Lord was still able to guide David and to keep him on the right path. And he was going to do so by means of this woman, Abigail. First, though, we're introduced to Abigail's husband, Nabal. We're not told his name at first, but we're told that he was very wealthy and he possessed lots and lots of goats and sheep. And then, having told us about his wealth, we're told his name, which is Nabal. And Nabal means fool. It's a Hebrew word for fool. And so, in Psalm 14, uh, it begins with the line, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. In the Hebrew, it's Nabal says in his heart, there is no God. Nabal is the Hebrew word for fool. Uh, who can know why his parents decided to give him that name? But it turned out to be the, to be the best name for him. Because as we'll discover, Nabal was very foolish. He was surly and mean in his dealings, we're told. Or as another translation puts it, he was harsh and badly behaved. His wife, however, was intelligent and beautiful. And we read that David sent some of his men to go up to Nabal, who was shearing his sheep at the time, to ask him for food. And you can read in verses 5 to 8 what David told his men to say. Uh, Greet him in my name, wish him well and his household well. Remind him how David's men had provided protection for Nabal's men when they were minding the sheep. And since we've come at a festive time, when everyone is in a generous mood and is feasting, please give us something to eat. Whatever, whatever you can find will do. 
And so we read that David's men went to Nabal and said what David told them to say. And then they waited for Nabal's answer. And Nabal, this surly, mean, badly behaved man, was rude and insulting. Who is this David? He asked. Well, of course, he knows who David is. Everyone had heard about David, but Nabal doesn't care. He's not bothered. He's not impressed by David at all. Who is this son of Jesse? He asked. He's saying, you know, he's nobody to me. As far as I'm concerned, he's just a runaway servant. And so uh, he says, why should I take my bread and my water and my meat for my shearers and give it to him? Notice how he repeats the word my. He's mean and he's selfish. And so David's men turned around and they went back to David to report what Nabal had said. And David's reaction is startling, isn't it? We haven't seen this side of David before. Put on your swords, he said to his men. So they put on their swords and David put on his sword. Uh, In the Hebrew text, the word sword is repeated three times to underline for us what they were thinking and what they were planning to do. They weren't going on a picnic. They weren't going sightseeing. They were going with their swords to make war on Nabal. 400 of them set off to massacre Nabal and all those who belonged to him. But providentially, providentially, one of the servants told Abigail what had happened and how Nabal had insulted David's men. And he explained to Abigail how David and his men had protected Nabal's men when they were looking after their sheep. David and his men were like a wall around us, he said, like a protective wall to keep us from danger. And he asked Abigail to do something because disaster was hanging over their house because of her husband. Abigail lost no time. She got together a load of provisions to give to David and his men. And she told her servants to go on ahead of her and she would follow behind. But she didn't tell her husband what she planned. She didn't tell him, presumably, because she knew what he was like and how he would only object. And we're told that she headed out to find David. And here's David coming in verse 20. And we're allowed to hear what David is is thinking and saying. Uh, He's thinking about how Nabal has repaid him evil for good. He had done good to Nabal by guarding his men and his sheep so that not one of his possessions had gone missing, but Nabal had only done him evil. Some of the commentators suggest that there might have been an agreement between these two men and that Nabal had previously agreed to repay David for protecting his property. But now Nabal has broken his promise. And take a look at verse 22. If you've got your Bible open in front of you, David intends to kill every single male in Nabal's household. That's how angry he is. So that's what David was thinking. But here comes Abigail who bowed down before David before addressing him. And her speech is quite long and detailed. So let me try to summarize the main points Firstly, in verse 24, she says, let the blame be on me alone. Some of the commentators think that she's accepting responsibility for what has happened. She's saying, it's all my fault. And no doubt there are wives who are listening to this today. And from time to time, uh, you've had to apologize for your husband. Because we husbands uh, often say foolish things, don't we? But it's also possible that this is just the customary way in those days to begin this kind of conversation. Think of the way we sometimes begin a conversation with the words, excuse me, excuse me for interrupting. Uh, Maybe that's what she's doing. And she asks David anyway to listen to her. Secondly, in verse 25, she asks David not to pay any attention to her husband. 
Again, there will be wives listening to this, and you've perhaps said that about your husband. Don't pay any attention to him. He's talking nonsense. Abigail therefore asks David not to pay any attention to your husband because he's really only a fool who shouldn't be taken seriously. And if I had been there when your men came to the farm, I would have prevented my foolish husband from refusing your men. Thirdly, and, and this is remarkable, she knows, she knows that David will one day be king of God's people. Look with me at verse 28 where she says that the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for David. A dynasty is a line of rulers or kings who are descended from one another. And what Abigail says here is similar to what the Lord uh, said to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 where the Lord promised to establish a house or a dynasty for David so that his house and his kingdom will endure forever. He and his descendants will, will rule over God's people. So Abigail believed that David will one day be the king. And she says something similar in verse 30, where she says that the Lord will appoint David as leader over Israel. David will one day be king. She knows that. She believes it. The question then is, what kind of king will he be? Will he be the kind of king who fights the Lord's battles? Do you see how she mentions the Lord's battles in verse 28? In other words, will he be the kind of king who goes to war on behalf of the Lord to protect the Lord's people from harm and to rescue them from the Lord's enemies? That's what the Lord's anointed king should do. That's the kind of king David should be. But right now, it seems to Abigail, David is in danger of becoming the kind of king who does not fight the Lord's battles, but who fights his own battles. Look at verse 26, where she refers to bloodshed and to avenging yourself with your own hands. And she repeats that phrase in verse 31, where she warns David that he doesn't want on his conscience the burden of needless bloodshed and of having avenged himself. So will he be the kind of king with a reputation for fighting the Lord's battles and doing the will of the Lord? Or will he be the kind of king who is known as someone who murders and kills out of personal revenge. And she reassures David that the Lord will always watch over him. Look at verse 29. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, and she's presumably referring to Saul because he's the only one who is pursuing David to take his life at that time. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my master, David, will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. So just as we might put something in our wallet or purse to keep it safe, so the Lord will keep David safe. Uh, but the lives of your enemies, he will hurl away as from the pocket of of a sling. There's no need for David to murder and to kill out of personal revenge because he can trust in the Lord to keep him and to deal with his enemies on his behalf. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord in another place. I will repay. So don't think about repaying your enemies because you can trust in the Lord to punish your enemies on your behalf. So what kind of king will you be, David? And you see, whenever Abigail went out to find David that day, she wasn't so much going out to save her husband. Because from what she said in verse 26, it seemed she was expecting the Lord to punish her husband. No, when she went out that day to find David, she went out to save David's reputation and his good name, and to ensure that he would be the right kind of king. 
And having said everything she needed to say, she concluded her speech by asking David to remember her, remember to show her favor and mercy and to do her good. Many of us don't like being uh, told that we're in the wrong. Many of us don't like to receive advice from anyone. Many men don't like to take advice from women. But David was willing to listen to Abigail, and he praised the Lord who sent her to meet him. And he asked the Lord to bless her for her good judgment and for keeping him from bloodshed and for keeping him from taking revenge. In other words, she has saved his reputation. And he received the food she brought for him, and he sent her home. And the chapter ends by telling us that when Nabal heard what had happened, his heart failed him, and he became like stone. And about ten days later, the Lord struck him, and he died. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay the Lord's servants, and especially the Lord's anointed king, must not take revenge, but must leave it to the Lord. And we're told that David took Nabal as his wife, and he also had another wife at that time. Uh, meanwhile, Saul had given his first wife, Michael, to another man. The Lord's servants, and especially the Lord's anointed king, must not take revenge, because the Lord commands his people to love even our enemies and to bless those who curse us. Get rid of all bitterness, Paul tells us in his letter to the Ephesians. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Be imitators of God, Paul tells us, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us. And think of how the Lord Jesus loved the people around him when he was here on the earth, and how he refused to take revenge on those who hated him. When the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the Sadducees came to argue with him and to try to trap him into saying something to incriminate himself, uh, he was patient with them. Though they plotted to do him evil, he never retaliated. When the guards came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, uh, he wouldn't let his disciples fight back, and he told Peter to put away his sword. When he was falsely accused before the Sanhedrin, he did not retaliate or hurl insults and accusations at his enemies. When he was being tried by Pilate, he didn't threaten Pilate. When the soldiers beat him and whipped him and nailed him to the cross, he could have called for an army of angels to come down out of heaven to destroy his enemies. But instead, he prayed for his enemies. Both of the criminals who were crucified with him insulted him at the beginning. But when one eventually asked the Lord to remember him, the Lord was willing to pardon him and to reassure him of eternal life. And he didn't retaliate when the people passing by mocked him and insulted him. The Lord Jesus, who is God's true anointed king, did not retaliate when insulted. He did not make threats when he suffered. He did not repay evil for evil or insult for insult. Instead, he entrusted himself to his Father in heaven, and he was willing to suffer and to die on the cross to pay for your sins with his life and to wash away your guilt with his blood. The Lord sent Abigail to David to keep him from bloodshed and from taking revenge because David was to display to the world what God's true anointed king would be like. And God's true anointed king did not come to take revenge but to give salvation to all who will believe in him. And think about your life. Perhaps you're a believer and a member of Christ's kingdom. Perhaps you've been a Christian for many years. 
And yet there have been many times when you have been like Nabal and you've, ref you've refused to serve and to honor Christ your King. Though he gave up his life for you, there have been many times when you have disobeyed him and when you've been unwilling to do his will and when you have refused to serve him as you should. There have been times when you have dishonored him by the things that you have said and done. He commands you in his word to love and serve him. But how many times have you said no to him in your heart? How many times have you dishonored him and refused to serve him? And yet, instead of becoming impatient with you, instead of strapping on his sword and striking you down, he has been patient with you, hasn't he? And in heaven, he stands before his Father and he's praying for you. He's interceding for you, reminding the Father in heaven that he has paid for all of your sins and your shortcomings. It's as if he's standing there in heaven and he's saying to his Father, do not treat him as his sins deserve. Do not repay her for her iniquity, but for my sake, forgive them. Instead of taking revenge, he has done all things necessary to secure your salvation. And he offers salvation to all who will believe in him. No matter what you may have done to offend him, he offers forgiveness and peace and eternal life to all who trust in him as the only savior of the world. And he'll not send away anyone who comes to him humbly confessing their sin and asking for forgiveness. He will not send them away in a huff, but he'll gladly welcome them and bring them into his kingdom. And Christ our King who loved us and who gave up his life for our salvation commands us to follow his example and to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And he gives you his spirit to help you. He gives you his spirit to help clean out of your heart bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander and every form of malice. He gives you his spirit to fill your heart with love and compassion so that your life here on earth will reflect the gentleness and the kindness and the compassion and the patience of Jesus Christ, your Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ, our Savior, who did not retaliate when insulted, and he did not make threats when he suffered, but he gave up his life to pay for our sins and to make peace between us forever. Help us to trust in him always for the forgiveness of our sins. And will you fill us with his spirit to enable us to live a life of love and to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as in Christ we have been forgiven. We pray too that the good news of salvation through faith in your Son will be proclaimed throughout the world despite the restrictions caused by the coronavirus crisis. We pray that the gospel message will be proclaimed to all the nations and that you will enable those who hear to believe in the Savior and to call out to him for salvation. You have said that whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. And so will you bless the preaching of your word so that those who hear will believe and call on his name. Will you build Christ's church throughout the world? And will you give your church faithful preachers to feed your people and faithful elders to oversee them and faithful deacons to take care of them and enable your people around the world to love and serve one another because this is your will for them. We cry out to you on behalf of this troubled world, asking that you will have mercy on us. You are a good God, and you cause the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. You're good to all, 
Therefore, will you do good to all, and will you bring this crisis to an end so that all over the world people will be able to go out without fear of infection? We thank you for the good news about a vaccine, and we pray that it will be effective and used widely. While the crisis continues, help the governments of the world to know how best to respond to it and how to support those who have been affected badly. We pray that whatever restrictions they order will be effective in containing the virus. And we pray that you'll help people everywhere to comply with the restrictions. We pray again for those who are caring for the sick and the dying, asking that you'll uphold them and help them with their work. Help those who are caring for the elderly in nursing homes and care homes. And will you keep the residents and the staff safe and well? And help all who are struggling with the separation from loved ones and from all the other disruptions. Help your people around the world to stand firm in the faith and to do good. Help us not to be anxious about tomorrow, but to trust in you, our Heavenly Father, for all that we need. And help us to be hopeful, trusting that our times and our lives are in your hands. And we pray that our churches will be reopened and will never have to close. And we ask all of these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Let's praise God by singing before the throne of God above. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me My name is graven on his hands My name is written on his heart I know that while in heaven he stands No tongue can bid me thence depart No tongue can bid me thence depart Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul. forth in the name of the Lord. This is God's charge. We should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.